Well, Justin, welcome to Data Talk. Thanks for having me. Excited to uh, get, have a chance to sit down and talk with you this morning. I thought it'd be great if we could start off talking about a little bit about your career journey. Well, it's uh, it's been an interesting one, that's for sure. I, um, you know, you always hear people talk about being in the right place at the right time, and um, yeah, there's definitely something to be said for being lucky rather than being good. <laughs> and it's possible that a lot of people would uh, say that I resemble that uh, remark. But uh, no, I, I, I uh, was really very fortunate that uh, when I was getting out of my undergraduate uh, education, I just happened to coincide with the federal deregulation um, rollout that was happening in the mid-1990s. And so the deregulation in the electricity business had been, you know, there's, there's a long history of deregulation at the federal level. A lot of us are familiar with, you know, if you're old like me, you might remember when the airlines deregulated. Uh, they used to not be deregulated. And then we had telecommunications. Some folks that are a little bit younger, younger will remember that. Like we used to actually have to select our long distance provider and our local provider. And so that was all part of that unbundling. And then a little bit more uh, opaque to the broader community, the same thing happened in natural gas. And you know the, the, the reason for all that is if you looked at you know, what it cost for airline travel and what it cost for telecommunications, et cetera, et cetera, it was a huge boon, um, a huge windfall and a big W for consumers. And so the idea was that the power and electricity would be the same thing. And that's what we've seen in a lot of mo most places, at least as far as I can tell, uh, versus the old vertically integrated regulated structure. So I was real lucky to get in right as the, the whole market was opening up where you actually had third parties that were allowed to get in and trade. And it was so early that, um, you know, we, we, we were so new to all this stuff that we did a little bit of everything. So I was really very fortunate that, you know, if I'd come in 10 years later, you know, we would have, I would have been somebody that, uh, you know, learned one piece of the business or one aspect of the business. But I was real fortunate um, to have a chance to look at the, you know, get involved with the day to day scheduling, the logistics, the minutia of how electricity works in all the markets across the United States and uh, transmission and then uh, managing power plants and more recently uh, being involved with the deregulated markets on the residential level or the, the competitive markets at the residential level when those opened here in Texas in, in early, the early 2000s. That's uh, that, what an amazing story. Tell, tell me about like some of the challenges early on, like you're jumping into the electricity industry and have, having to learn so much. Well, it was interesting, uh, you know, I remember day one, uh, you know, power is this weird thing where you say it's a power plant has this much or a scheduled quantity of electricity is this amount instantaneously, but it has to show up over the course of an hour. So that's how you get a megawatt hour. So it's a one megawatt that's running continuously for an hour. And because of that, the way that notations of time use, like they don't say it's at two o'clock in the afternoon, they'll say it's at hour ending 1400. So the very first day I showed up at work, I didn't even know how to tell time. <laughs> so, so that's that's how, you know, completely and utterly lost uh, a lot of us were when we first uh, got into the wild world of some of this. But in addition to it being a, a completely different animal, um, you know, I was fortunate I, I was able to, to train and learn from a lot of folks that had been in power dispatching. They'd run uh, these systems load and generation for years and years. So we, we got a very hands-on physical education. Um, but, you know, the other problem is because it was deregulating at the federal level, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty as to what does this rule mean and what can be done with this. So a lot of it was figuring these things out, which actually ended up being a great thing because what it meant was the industry had to kind of really discuss amongst themselves and, and we, had, we had to achieve a lot of consensus. And so it was a really neat environment, uh, you know, to begin my professional career in where everything was new. Um, just because you might have been in the electricity business for 20 years didn't mean that those skills and that understanding directly translated to the way the new world uh, was unfolding. So it was really neat. Uh, I was able to spend a lot of time with uh, unbelievably intelligent people in the industry, um, get exposed to lots of different things. And when something is new, uh, you know, 
someone like myself that was young at the time, you know, you're able to kind of carve your way out versus a lot of the industry and, and hierarchy being set in stone. So I was able to, to you know, figure things out and, and you know, had the, had the freedom and the latitude to, to try to grow quickly. Yeah, I love how you like just like went into that very risky environment doing something brand new. How did your like your friends and family respond when you were moving into an entirely new industry? Um, and there are so many challenges. Well, it's, you know, electricity is a weird thing. It, it literally is one of those things that most people don't spend any time thinking about. We just, you know, the way we've always used it here and, you know, in the United States, at least, and in North America is like we turn the switch on and it works. Like someone sends us a bill and we just don't really spend that much time thinking about it. I mean, today there's a, a big push with respect to, you know, environmental consciousness. So I think that 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 some of that information has is, is made its way into a little bit more of the public's imagination. I think it's not a direct day-to-day -day thing. It's more of an aspirational kind of thing. So a lot of people, when I first got involved with this, really kind of didn't understand it. And it's very difficult um, to explain to someone that's not super interested. <laughs> It's about as exciting and as about as sexy as us talking about dentistry skills. Um, not not to um, denigrate uh, any of the dentists who might be listening, but it's just not one of those sexy topics. And uh, so it was it was definitely kind of interesting um, talking to people about getting involved with this. Wow, yeah, I, I definitely see what you mean there. What made you choose to operate in Texas in particular? Did you see a particular need in Texas? So. Um, that's a great question. You know, generally, if you look at the way the country is split up, and, and we really operate this as almost a North American system. So the the Mexican uh, system is integrated in in many places in the Western um, system, the WECC. Western Canada is involved with that as well. And then we have Texas as its own geographic uh, electric system. It's it's separated it's remote from the other systems and then we have the eastern interconnect which you know uh, runs all the way through um you know into the the canadian maritimes all the way through to, to florida so it's one big integrated system and so they all have their regional differences again fortunate enough that i was able to you know We've had uh, plenty. I spent my early career working in the Western United States, a lot in the desert Southwest, trading power in, in, the, in the California markets um, and those areas as well. We ended up at, at my uh, original employer, we ended up buying a utility in Illinois. So I had a huge portfolio of power generation that I was managing there as well. And we built thousands and thousands of megawatts of power generation from New York through to the Southeast. So lots of experience and lots of um, um, opportunity for me to learn how all these different regional markets worked. Um, but Texas in particular, uh, you know, it, I ended up falling into being much more focused on what's happening in Texas because uh, the, the consumer choice, the deregulation of electricity consumption um, really is that it, it's you know greatest uh, expression here in Texas? It's been the most successful uh, competitive market in the United States by far. There's some geographic reasons why that's the case, and some of it's a, um, a real willingness to allow the market to figure things out. Um, but it's been very very robust here, and you know we focused on the energy ogre business here in Texas because there was a pretty clear need for uh, customers to have, uh, to really need some assistance in going through this process to run through the analytics and, uh, and how the data is compiled and more importantly used on that customer's behalf. So, so that's really why we, we, we got focused here because it's by far the most uh, dynamic. Uh, it, it has the greatest number of, of competitors in the marketplace. And because of that, there's a lot of advertising and a lot of uh, information that's made available to the public that makes it difficult, I think, for some uh, some people when they're not really trying to pay attention to electricity to really focus on uh, trying to separate the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. You talk about some of the data being compiled. Can you talk a little bit about that data and how it's used? Sure. You know, there's um, 
one of the first things that was uh, uh, kind of an interesting uh, big leap uh, as we look at this market. So when this market first opened, and this is not terribly dissimilar from what we see in a lot of the other markets across the country that are open, um, you'll have a number of providers that come in. So, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of the Burger King mentality. Like in the old world, there is going to be a tariff and you're going to pay a tariff rate and a tariff structure. And when you move to competition, people think it's just about people competing, but it's not just about people competing. That's definitely a big part of it. But part of it is um, it's like every other marketplace that's competitive. Uh, folks will be come up with better products that meet consumers needs better and so now not only do we have a proliferation of new competitors we have different products and different products and services that now now you're trying to figure out which one of these uh, types of products fits um, my needs more appropriately than just sort of the cookie cutter i got to take it from the investor-owned utility or from the you know municipal utility so there's a lot of data associated with just the proliferation of different offers, different kinds of, of um, you know, rate plans and how they're structured. Some of them might be, hey, nighttime hours are going to be this rate, like our old cell phone stuff used to be, like you would get free nights and weekends or whatever. And some of those things have occurred here as well. Um, so that was kind of the first big analytical challenge is trying to sift through all these various different rate programs and they how do you make them all apples to apples how do you put them and how do you consolidate them on a basis that allows you to really be able to assess each one of these versus uh, versus the, each other and so that's a very large uh, data acquisition there's an aggregation of information um, there's a, a process uh, a methodology that you have to go through to sift through that to put them into a standardized format so we can look at them on an apples to apples basis with one another. And then not too far after that, I think about it as kind of the second revolution of what happened in the competitive markets here in Texas. You know, we moved away from demand meters to quote unquote smart meters. And that from a data perspective is, um, you know, it's a granularity of information that didn't exist before, but it was a very, very, I think in many respects, it's an underappreciated sea change that happened. But up until that point in time, a meter reader would come out and they would say, hey, on this day, the reading was this many kilowatt hours. And then they came out, you know, 28 to 34 days later and they took another reading and they said, here's, so they would look at your consumption across that 30 day period, but they had no way to know what day you used what, let alone what hour you used what. And in our market and in all of the electricity markets, they actually settle in five to 15 minute increments. Like how the, how the electricity flows is very important. And so there was this big subsidization, a big profile that was done that wasn't really allocating people's consumption uh, appropriately from when they did that. So the smart meter technology, now that it starts to be used for settlements, et cetera, it's generating information here in Texas. Uh, we record uh, an integrated value every 15 minutes. So every customer has 96 data points per day of how they use, and that's, that's how they're actually built. And so now we start getting into being able to provide incentives for people to actually do free nights and weekends and things of that nature. Not that those are good plans, but start to change these behaviors and, and push people in ways that are responsive to you know what, what makes more sense um, you know given what's happening in wholesale prices. So that's a big big difference. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data, but if if you can just sort of think through that, what that means for us is if I've got thousands of different rate plans that we figured out how to put them all on an apples to apples basis. That means that we have thousands of different supply curves uh, that we're looking at. And each one of our customers now has a unique demand profile. Just because you and I might have the same, let's say that we bought from the same builder and we have the same floor plan and we might live next door to each other, how I use electricity is absolutely gonna be different from the way you use electricity. And so now each one of these customers has a unique demand curve 
And we have thousands and thousands of supply curves that we can choose from. And so we can run some algorithms that will uh, start to undertake the process to select the lowest cost to serve your unique demand profile. Yeah, no, that's really interesting to hear the way that Energy Ogre uses consumers' data. I know that Energy Ogre is focused on using renewable energy. Can you tell us about what renewable energy is and what the future holds for renewable resources? Sure, there's a tremendous sure, amount of um, you know consumer interest uh, in in renewables and you know the consciousness of um, you know the types of things that we're doing from uh, from a carbon minimization, carbon neutrality perspective, that's really kind of captured uh, a lot of folks' attention. Um, and so really you can think about renewables in, in two forms. So there's renewables that happen at the grid scale. And so there are large generating businesses, companies, uh, power projects that are going to be renewable projects. And so renewables Actually, you know, we, we've had a long-standing relationship in the U.S. with renewable energy. Um, people don't really think about it this way, but hydroelectric generation is renewable, and so uh, you know, a, a lot of folks might have been to Ve Vegas and seen Hoover Dam, and and if you look up in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of that uh, power generation on the mid on the Columbia River, there's a, a huge amount of hydroelectric generation there. So we've had that in our portfolio for a very very long time. Some of the more emergent technologies, um, you know, we're all familiar with seeing wind generation and, and that's really been a large, we've had a huge proliferation of, of wind uh, as, the, as the technology's gotten a little bit less expensive over time as the uh, materials and the technologies really improved, what you end up having is um, much larger individual units that, that have a little bit of an economy of scale there have been very large um, um, tax incentives and other types of, of uh, subsidies that have um, sparked the interest in developers building a lot of these big grid scale uh, wind facilities. And we're starting to see the same now, uh, at least in Texas, in solar that's grid scale solar. And so they're, they're, that's one aspect of those types of technologies that we see that are, they, they look just like the other power plants. Um, but they're, 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 they're large and they're centralized and they, they run into the same system that every other power plant runs into. And then on the other side of it we have, and it's predominantly solar, you'll have folks that want to install solar facilities and systems on their house. And so those things all happen behind the meter. So you know if you were to look at a lot of the new renewables deployment in places like California, you know, because of statutes, because of uh, building requirements, uh, my understanding is most of those homes have to have, or there's a, a large incentive to place solar in new construction and retrofit, and it, you know, for, for them, given what's happening in their infrastructure. So behind the meter uh, renewable, behind the meter solar, is there's a big push. Uh, we're seeing that, you know, it's, it's happening nationwide. And so there's, there's pros and cons associated with both of those. Um, they're definitely um, um, having, you, you got to have the right mix and balance of generation capacity to ensure reliability. Just because um, a renewable generation, it actually, it, the, the positive thing is the fuel is free. And so it's hard to beat having free fuel. If you look at a natural gas plant or you look at a coal plant, a non-trivial amount of their, their cost of electricity production is in the fuel. And so, you know, if you think about it on economics alone, uh, as long as the install costs are not prohibitive, uh, renewables should be able to win in the, in the very long term. Uh, the, the challenge with renewables today is that, um, you know, because we don't really change our consumption behavior, given what's happening with overall demand, we don't see that, we don't get those signals as consumers today. Electricity has this weird aspect to it that people don't really think about a whole lot is it's literally the only commodity that you consume maybe besides telecommunications it's produced distributed and consumed at the speed of light we we can't really store it in real time and so whatever we whatever customers are demanding in real time that has to be produced in real time and that's kind of proven to be 
the potential Achilles heel of, of some of what we're doing in, in terms of continuing to add more and more renewable generation because, because we get out of it whatever it lets us get out of it. Um, it's very difficult for us to do that. So a, as we move forward in time, I absolutely expect that we're gonna see improvements in energy storage technologies. Um, those, that's gonna be a big, big uh, unlocking tool for the, the added deployment of, I think, renewable technologies. But we definitely see a huge interest level amongst you know, our customer base um, in, in being involved in, 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 in purchasing energy that has you know, green aspects associated with it. And so there's a scheme here in Texas, the way we, we account for the production of that that makes it relatively easy for us to, to account for that and to ensure that we're you know, incenting generation that way. I'm curious about predictions and as you're, you know, gathering data from different houses and how they're using uh, electricity in real time, you're getting, like you said, every 15 minutes, you're getting data points. Um, how is that helping with predictions? And then what are some things that maybe are really hard, like events that happen that can make it hard to predict on how much energy is going to be needed? Sure. Um, you know, that's an excellent question, and that's a big part of what we're doing here as well. Uh, so one of the things that we, we look at very, very closely is uh, how predictable is your behavior given recent patterns, you know, things that you've done. So different sorts of homes have different levels of predictability. You know, a good example of that might be, um, you know, we have a number of our members that, that'll have, let's say, a beach house or someplace down in Galveston. And so the, the consumption and demand there is going to be very intermittent. It's not predictable like you would see your primary home. Uh, in other places, if, we, if you know, it's your primary residence and, and we're looking at what's happening there, over a long enough period of time, we have a pretty good understanding of um, if you, there, there's this notion in, in weather prediction that talks about cooling degree days and heating degree days. I don't know if you have any familiar with, familiarity with it, but it's basically a deviation from um, uh, around a set point temperature of how far off of an average temperature is that, and they translate that into a cooling degree day metric. And so what we do is we look at cooling and heating degree day metrics for our customers and, and look at them over a long enough period of time that not only allows us to have an expectation on a predictable basis, on a, on a moving forward basis, but it also helps us spot anomalies in, in their consumption. And so that might be an important thing. It's not um, unheard of where let's say someone has um, a new pool installed or they might have a new pool pump or a new water heater and there maybe is a problem with the installation of that. So they're gonna have this huge consumption deviation from what they normally would do. Well, that's something that we will eventually pick up and, and bring to that person's attention. So there's some things that we can do in seeing by looking through this information to look at anomalous consumption profiles and see if that's really a problem. Secondarily, as I said before, remember we're looking at the optimized plan for someone's consumption profile. And so there's a, you know, there's a potential for putting someone into a particular plan that's really optimized to their legacy consumption profile. But let's say that um, we have a pandemic hit and then people are working from home and their kids come back from college and all of a sudden their consumption changes. Well, what they're, what they're in may not be the right thing on a going forward basis. It provides us an opportunity to continuously monitor to make sure that they're in the most effective rate structure given the realities of how they're consuming. So that's a big part of what we're looking at as well is to look at these deviations and to make sure that's, that's why for us it's not a one and done. Um, people think it's a plan picking service and that's not really the case for us because we are continuing to look through this information and apply applied this data into ways that, that lead to better outcomes for these customers. Can you talk about some of the uh, kind of the exciting products that have been developed lately because of deregulation and as you have different innovative companies developing new products to be more competitive, are there anything that you see on the horizon or things that have really impressed you? Well, you know, I think where we are is um, What's happened, you know, what's really strange about the way the electricity market is developed, it's kind of developed just because it happens in real time a little bit different than everything else we buy. And so, you know, if, um, if we were to look at the gasoline markets, 
if we have a problem with wholesale oil prices moving higher or there's a you know war in the Middle East or something like that, well, we see that translate into pricing at the pump relatively quickly and people change their behavior based upon the prices that they're seeing. Power doesn't really work that way. And so we've had this whole notion where someone might see that, but it, it always happens on a prospective basis. So what's happened is, is the Whatever it takes to fix the wholesale market is kind of happening separate and distinct from what's happening at pricing at the retail level. And a lot of times that's because there's not, and there's not enough information that makes its way back to a consumer to change their behavior, and let alone the, the price incentive to get someone to change their behavior. I think that's what we will end up seeing. We, Demand management and demand response has been a buzzword in this industry for as long as I've been involved with it. But what, what's happened is that with competitive markets and some of these other structures, in fact, you don't even have to have a fully competitive market. But now technology has advanced to a point where demand can be changed and, and demand can be programmatically uh, set up um, if you've compiled enough information about the footprint of, of a home and what those preferences look like for a customer there's a, a level of automation that can be put in place to start to introduce some price elasticity of demand into the electricity business that's never existed before and that is a huge huge change and that's going to be a, a extremely positive change is that is that you know, makes its way out over time because, you know, historically, if we look at any of these, you know, uh, areas of the country, you would usually have a reliability overseer that says, hey, our maximum demand for last year was this, and we expect next year to be this. And if we have to produce it while we consume it, and we're trying to maintain a safety margin, then someone somewhere had to build a power plant and to meet that incremental demand year over year. And some and the good news is a lot of that stuff is being done, um, you know, with with, with very emissions friendly and, and either emissions free or emissions friendly types of generation. But it's not. A, I, I think if you really look at it to say it's a lot easier to get people to avoid five percent of their consumption, so we don't ever we don't ever have to build that plant. And I think most people would be would be up for that. Uh, if they thought about all those consequences and what it saved them, they just don't have a mechanism to be able to do that efficiently today. So I think that's forthcoming. Um, given, you know, if we thought about, you know, I still laugh with my kids. I've got teenagers and I've got a 13-year-old, my youngest, and she always laughs at me. And we have to preface, my wife and I, when telling this story, that was before cell phones. <laughs> you know, like, that, this happened. Why didn't you just do this? So, you know, we have these technologies that make their way into our lives that just become seamlessly integrated with what we're doing. And I think now that we have, you know, that type of communications infrastructure and that, that kind of integration into our homes, I think it's, it's an inevitability that we'll start to, to develop some of these things. So it's, it's going to be companies like Energy Yoga that figure out how to utilize the data on behalf of these customers working for their interests. Um, to, to start to be that bridge in this process. I think that it's, it's, um, it's, it's a key component in being able to make that happen. That's a big innovation that, you know, it's, to me it's almost as big if I look at it, um, the consequences are almost as large as deregulating electricity to begin with. It is, the, it is a huge opportunity out there uh, and we're, we're excited to be involved with that on behalf of our consumers. Yes, definitely. And just going into the technology that you're using at Energy Ogre, using that predictive technology and the machine learning to like predict the habits of your consumers and using it in this particular industry, are you seeing any trends of, you know, big businesses around the US using that sort of technology or is this sort of like a slow rollout situation where, you know, it's you're not seeing it as much, but you're using it and you're seeing success. Right. So I think the good news is, is um, if I had to sum up the way I think it's been working, I, I don't know if, if this is the way other industries work, um, but I've, this is certainly a trend that, that I've seen here. 
So a lot of what we're seeing, I'm far more focused and, and much closer to the way a residential consumer is interacting in these in these residential types of things. We have a, a lot of business activity and I have a long history in the commercial side as well. So what we're seeing is these technologies and how you apply machine learning, these are follow-ons to things that we saw happen in the commercial space 10 or 15 years ago. They're, they're just slowly making their way down into the residential level. So for example, if I had a manufacturing facility um, out here, let's say I had someplace out in Houston and I were running uh, a big plant, big, big, um, big operations, I might have a distributed control system or I might have uh, somebody that's come in to do a complete energy management system, you know, someone like a Honeywell or somebody like that that's built a controls package for me that's trying to constrain, optimize all of my production, you know, time, taking into account time of when this runs, uh, but, but focused on minimizing my energy spend at the same time. And, and that's the types of things that we've seen because the scale of the of the spend is so large, the resources that a lot of commercial uh, entities can spend on building that controls infrastructure, it makes economic sense for them. When you looked at that at the residential level, the spend to what you get out of it on the backside is just what hadn't been compelling historically. But this is what the slow march forward in um, technology and the, the absolute uh, economies of scale that we're seeing in you know what it cost me to store data compared to what it would have cost 10 years ago it's just not even remotely close how easy it is to you know spin up for us run vir virtual machines you know to handle a task and do those things on demand versus the cost of what that would have been 10 or 15 years ago so what we're seeing is really being able to take advantage of best practices that we've seen roll out over a long period of time but take advantage of the massive economies of scale to bring those same types of technologies into other areas. Are you considering expanding your company? And how do you know if that's like the right route for you to go? Because I do know that you've, you've done work all around North America. So do you know if you're going to expand your company? Sure, in terms of geographic scale, yeah. So, you know, here in Texas, we continue to grow every day and we're, you know, fortunate enough that a lot of our um, members continue to share their experiences with their friends and family and, and folks that they know. And, you know, we, we've been fortunate to, to guide people through uh, the winter storm and not dealing with a bunch of negative consequences associated with that. So that's that's been a real positive for us. And, be, you know, we're very, very uh, customer focused insofar as we actually have a fiduciary responsibility to all of our customers. So we're as aligned with a consumer as I think you can get. Um, for us, in terms of geography, uh, honestly, the, 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 the positive news is as we start to roll out some of these demand management technologies, those, those kind of are, they don't go out of style in any of these jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions, I can't help folks choose amongst suppliers and choose amongst plans because they may still be in the old regulated structure or they may not have a choice. But every one of these places still has to deal with what's happening in the wholesale market, what it costs to serve their customers. And every one of them should have an incentive uh, to work with consumers to be judicious about conservation, conservation of, of you know, resources and fuel during peak periods of time. So I think the demand management and the demand response activities that we were discussing before, that's gonna be a springboard for us to really bring our brand of, of customer service and customer assistance to lots of different people all over the United States as, as that rolls out over time. There's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has proposed some rulemaking, making it easier for that to occur uh, irrespective of the jurisdiction. So we're, again, we're on the precipice of a, of a, of a sea change in how this works and how involved and, and how empowered people are going to really be in, in having more than, you know, donating to something. I mean, they can definitely be a part of making sure this works more effectively, more cost effectively, more efficiently, 
Um, and, and I think that's an exciting thing. Based upon the interest that I see uh, in, in folks I, wanting to learn more about renewables or what, what part they can play, I, I really believe that as we start moving into some of these other demand technologies, uh, there's going to be a sincere interest to, to be doing this all over the country. I really hope so. And I think this next question is going to be applicable to every single industry. I want to know what advice do you have for leaders in making sure that their consumers feel that they're supported and they feel that they're advocated for? Well, you know, I, I think we we have an, a little bit of an advantage because we, we are a fiduciary. So we're not a middleman in the process. We're not independently trying to make our stuff. So I think our customers know from, from the beginning that we are aligned with them and only them. And that's one of the reasons that we did this as Energy Ogre is that no one had ever done that before. No one had ever said, hey, I, I'm not gonna get a kickback from some of these other providers of placing you with a provider that you don't know about. We don't do that. We, we, we are exclusively employed by our members and we don't get compensation from anybody else. You know, we, we, picked our, we picked our dog in that fight, so to speak. So I'm not sure that how much that applies to some of the other people. But you know, honestly, what, what we've seen is um, we've had a, a, a real interest in education. That's one of the reasons I love doing you know, these types of formats, particularly the long form. Uh, that allows us to explain a little bit more, but customer education and customer advocacy, um, that's a huge part of what we are, are focused on. And so we definitely want to grow our business, but we believe that um, from, from past trends to future trends, educating customers, making it fun, making it intelligible. Um, you know, I think the energy business has more acronyms and more jargon than probably any other business that, that I've heard of. And so it can be intimidating. I think, uh, I think making things easier for folks to understand and putting it in a fun, if you can possibly do such a thing, but putting it in, 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 a, in a fun way, um, really pays a lot of dividends as someone's trying to engage their, their customer base or their potential customer base. The other piece that we, we try to get to is, you know, our customer base, we run the entire, you know, slice of system. We've got folks that are in their 80s that really couldn't care less. They just want to know it works. And, you know, I've got folks that work in the industry that are electrical engineers that want to know down into the, you know, minutia exactly what we're doing. So in terms of the education, We've employed a you know layer of an onion type strategy, where or an Alice in Wonderland strategy where you you provide general information and there's a next layer and a next level and a next level and you can go as far down the rabbit hole as you want to go um, and and we'll provide that information or or, we'll, or try to educate um, at least things the way we see them. So interestingly enough, is we're is we're handling you know diverse populations of folks that have different backgrounds, different ideas of stuff, being able to uh, translate what we're talking about and being able to put it in terms that are understandable to everybody, it, it's an important aspect of what we're doing because otherwise people get overwhelmed and get intimidated by what, what they're seeing and hearing. Um, and it's very easy for a misunderstanding. Someone, you know, one of the things that we hear, hear a lot is you know, we have hurricanes and so there's a, you know, some of the conventional wisdom is, well, if you're with this provider, you're going to get your service restored faster after a hurricane, which is 100% not true. So just dispelling some of those things with people and how it actually works versus the conventional wisdom or what, you know, Cousin Frank said um, is a very important part of what we do here as well, just to arm people with the appropriate information. I love how customer focused you are. And for the technology leaders and data scientists who are maybe interested in pursuing a career uh, working on the data side in electricity, what are some things that they should be aware of or things that they should know about? Well, and there's, uh, you know, one, it's super dynamic and, and the, the sources of data and the granularity of data is improving all the time. And so that's a, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, you, you can get uh, loose, loose side of the forest for the trees sometimes just by getting incrementally uh, granular and, and much more expansive uh, sets of data. I think the, anyone that's looking at energy across the board, um, 
I really take into account, just not because I ever spent any time with any of them, but I, I look at some of the things in the past that have been successful, especially as it relates to technology rollouts. And, and, and ultimately, I think a lot of this has to do with data and how it's used. I think there are a lot of very good lessons uh, in the past it, it, as it relates to consumer products that are technology-based products. When I look at the genius of uh, perhaps what uh, Apple was able to do with Steve Jobs, is it's very, I mean, people have written about it. And we all have familiarity. I'm sure almost everybody has an Apple product. But if we think about it, you know, I remember when I was learning about computers in school, it was Microsoft DOS, MS-DOS, and it was, there was no graphical interface. It was all, you know, you're writing out your code. And having a Macintosh that was graphically oriented and you move through before Windows existed, that's an example of someone that's, that's taking a technology and being able to pull data down into a way that's just, it's, it's easier to use. And so I think that's one of those philosophies that um, I see a lot with people with their smart technologies. You know, there's a lot of smart home types of activities. Uh, some of them are energy related, some of them are not. Um, you know, at some point you have to ask your question, does someone really want to have their, their phone with 35 different specialty applications where you can you know, check in on you know, what color this light bulb is in this room and another app tells you how you can open and close your garage door from anywhere in the world. I, I think that making things simple, making things easy to use, uh, the, there's a, the real commoditization in terms of value, it seems to me, is, is, is translating into time for your, for your customers. So if you can find ways to deliver the maximum performance that the data allows you to discern to make good decisions, how you display that to people, and more importantly, how much of that you can just take care of in terms of offering up these suggestions and simplifying these processes that are very, very complicated behind the scenes. You know, all these businesses, I think, that will look... Um, uh, that will be successful and they probably have been successful they're a little bit like those ducks where it, it looks placid on the surface it looks simple as far as the customer interface but with what's actually happening behind the scenes in terms of calculations and expectations and, and how you're deriving information and all those interfaces and all the error correcting it's a massively challenging and, and massively complicated exercise that um, if you can you know avoid your customers having to get into the sausage factory that way and just just you know get the benefits of of all your hard work i think that's a winning strategy well i love this i love all the work that you're doing i love how customer focused you are how you're thinking about the future and using renewable energy for those that want to learn more about energy ogre and the work that you're doing what's the best way for them to probably do the that? easiest way is um is is through our website energyogre.com we've got a blog um, our Facebook page, we try to run through a series of weekly uh, chats and talk about things that are happening in the industry that are of you know, importance or relevance to our customers. So um, unfortunately, if you go through those, you probably have to listen to me a whole bunch. So that's a fair, fair <laughs> warning to any of your listeners. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, as I said, it's, a, it's fun to be able to be uh, out there and, and helping people. That, that's, that's the best part of, of, of having this business is a lot of times, you know, because you align yourself, as we've done this, um, you know, we're, we're just work for our customers. And so, you know, we're not selling anything. We're just, we come to work every day to help people that pay us to help them. And so that's a really neat, um, a neat way of going about it. I don't feel like we have to, convince someone to do something you know we're just uh, we're just helping people and it's such a neat thing for me um, you know after all my time in the energy industry where you're you know trying to trade with someone you're trying to make a bunch of money and make a good call and make a decision or decide if you're going to build this power plant or decide what fuel you're going to buy or who you're going to sell it to being able to just be in service uh, to, to, to your customer base is, is kind of a neat um, unbelievably rewarding thing and you know translates to uh, all the employee base here that they'll know all we're doing is helping people so it's, it's a lot of fun that's fantastic well thank you so much Justin, for being a data well, appreciate you having me very very nice uh spend time chatting with you thank you so much for listening to this episode of the data talk podcast we share new shows every week and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes including youtube videos on our experian news blog 
and get access to the full catalog by going to experian.com slash talk. And we always love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows or guests you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can leave a comment on iTunes or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab. You can also email me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.